Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Get Cooked. My name's Sarah Cook, and each week I'll be talking to people from our Australian and international rowing community and bringing their stories to you. And tonight I have a really exciting chat, which I've been looking forward to for some weeks now. It's with the 1996 Olympic Games gold medal winning pair combination of Megan Still, now Marks, Kate Allen, um, formerly Slatter, and their coach, Paul Thompson. Welcome, guys, and thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks for having us. (laughs) Okay, so we'll get into uh, at the beginning here. Let's hear what you're um, up to now, what you're doing, where are you in the world, because you're actually all in three different countries as well. So let's start with you, Megan. Okay. Um, For me, I had a bit of an interesting journey um, post-1996. I was fortunate enough to be invited to go along to the 2000 Games as an athlete liaison officer. And for me, that probably started the bit of the journey of um, seeing what it was like the team behind the team, if you'd like to call it that, um, in terms of seeing what the administration um, support programs were like for athletes. And I sort of went from that starting point through to I was based in Sydney after the Games and had the opportunity to work with New South Wales Institute of Sport um, in sort of an events management and um, program coordination sort of role and then moved back home to Canberra and um, started my very long but fantastic journey with ACT Academy of Sport. I've been there for about 19 years now in various roles working and I just love it. I feel really blessed to have the opportunity to still be working with athletes and high performance coaches and high performance service team and um, it's a real sort of honour to be a part of that athletic journey with you know the team. So um, yeah so I've done numerous roles um, with ACT Academy of Sport um, both as a program manager, also as a performance service manager, and currently I'm an individual athlete program manager, working with a whole variety of athletes from a whole range of sports, Olympic, Paralympic and Commonwealth Games sports, who are themselves on that journey trying to get to the Tokyo Games. Um, and also I work in the athlete wellbeing and engagement area as a manager in that space, and I've really enjoyed sort of starting to get across that side of things as well. Yeah, that's fantastic that uh, the athletes now, I guess, are able to learn from you and and such an experience, not only athlete, but also um, sport administrator. And, and I imagine that's a bit of a kick for them to work with you, um, as it was for me meeting you all those years ago. But I'll go on to that in a minute. Um, Kate, uh, can you tell us a little bit um, about where you are and what you're up to? Uh, well, I, it's morning here. I'm in London. So, yeah, we are rather diverse, at least space at the moment. So I uh, have been living in London for 10 years and absolutely loving it. Do miss home right now. I would love to be back in Australia, uh, closer to family and friends. Um, but there are some there have been some real pluses to be in London uh, just with the lockdown. Not so much at the present. Um, what I've been doing, I, I did work in finance and banking for a while and had a bit of a break and actually restudying. So looking at do, doing a master's of science in the nutrition space, I really want to make a difference for people's health and well-being um, and sort of health coaching. So I'm not too sure how that will turn out, but it's been a passion, I guess, of always doing something in the uh, food space and we'll see what transpires. Amazing. And Tomo, you've had a pretty interesting uh, journey to get to where you are right now uh, at this moment in time this evening. Can you tell us exactly where that is? Uh, Tianjin. It's uh, (laughs) a a small town of 15 million people, not too far away from Beijing. But uh, yeah, well... um, after after the Sydney Olympics, I was looking for some some uh, coaching challenges, and um, Boltz, Boltz encouraged me. Actually, he said, "Oh, you should go away. If he, he reckons I forgot the last bit, which was come home." So um, <laughs> so uh, I uh, I spent eighteen years with uh, with British rowing, and uh, was looking looking for a change after that. I was going to diversify a little bit and. 
had a phone call from Steve Redgrave and said, uh, how about we, how about you come over and spend a bit of time in, in China? And uh, it was an offer my wife couldn't refuse. So, uh, so yeah. that's where that's been. But so I'm pretty much based and in a bizarre twist, I less than a, live less than a kilometre away from Kate. So uh, we get to see quite a lot of each other, to be fair. Nice. So that, that I was going to say, I get to see his wife more than I get Brilliant to see Tomo. Yeah, it's awesome. Nice. And, you know, I was, I was a little bit flustered getting started with this interview because um, I think I've met all of you over the last 20 years. Um, Megan, I met you pretty early on in my career, having rowed at the ACT Academy of Sport and being coached by your husband, Gordon Marks, for a little while there. And, and I remember... Um, because of course I knew who you guys were pretty early on in my rowing career and it wasn't until a few years after I started that um, I met um, Megan and Gordo and when I realised that Megan was in fact Megan still from the pair it was like one of these real fangirl sort of moments and I think I probably like maybe looked like I kept my cool but I never did and I always used to go and talk to my parents and tell tell them about what Megan had said to us and and you know I remember that you managed um, our team I think it must have been for a youth olympics maybe in um, 2003 or something like that you you travelled with us, um, little ACT squad of athletes, and um, I just remember hanging off every word and, and every piece of advice that you gave us. So that was a real buzz for me early on in my rowing career, and I probably never gave that away at the time, but um, you certainly had a huge impact on me um, developing through that time. And um, then fast forward through to the 2008 Olympics, and Kate was actually our athlete liaison officer, so that was the first time that um, I got to meet her, and I was wearing the pair with Kimmy, and I know that for us, again, that was um, really cool to have you and someone who'd been through all of that there supporting us, and um, of course, Tomo. I've gotten to know over the years and often racing against his athletes, but uh, we also share um, some very good friends um, in common like Tim Gable and, and John Boltby. So always sort of keeping up with, I think, what one another are doing. So it's been really amazing to get to know each of you um, at least a little bit over the uh, later part of my career, but um, having such a huge impact and being huge role models um, for me as a female rower coming through the sport and being the winners of Australia's first female Olympic gold medal in rowing is um, completely uh, amazing. And, and I'd like to go back, I guess, to the beginning of your careers now, after I've waxed lyrical for a little while there, but um, can you tell us a little bit about how each of you got into rowing? Um, Tomo, we'll start how you started your um, rowing career as an athlete. Um, well, I started at school at Tilapia Park High and uh, <laughs> went, uh, went down to the, the boat club and started, but... Uh, Peter Shakespeare was a science teacher at uh, Narrabunda College, wow. and uh, so yeah, he got he got um, got myself and James Galloway together, and uh, we got a pair and went off to the World Juniors. So that was the first year. It was Julie Ellett and Kate McLaughlin as well, and we we were the first ones to to be Canberra based and do something on an Australian team. So so that's where my journey started, and. Um, yeah, still in touch with Pete, actually. I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago. He's up in, in Brisbane now, so. Oh, nice. Good. Glad to hear he's back from Canada, back in the right country. <laughs> um, how about you, Kate? How did you um, get into rowing? I'm probably different to most people. I turned up to Adelaide University and I was with a friend at the time. We thought, right, what sport should we take up, you know, you know? orientation week and we decided that we'd measure it on the most good looking boys so I started rowing <laughs> um from my week I love rowing on the Torrens in Adelaide I think I fell in a few times in a single skull and that wasn't probably my finest moment it's like pretty much pond in the middle of Adelaide um so I you know I mean purely for the boys and here comes my daughter sorry um <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 real world. Hey Georgia, watch uh, out. <laughs> that's my eldest. Has yet to start rowing. Hey, hey Georgia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I try to get the quietest place in the house. Apologies, um, but yeah, I um yeah. So purely for getting into it for fun, social reasons. Look, I end up being lucky enough to date one of the guys that was good looking for three years. So all good, I guess. <laughs> 
each to their own. Um, Megan, how did you get into the sport? You had a bit of a different um, pathway in as well. Oh, I did. Um, so my journey was through talent identification program. Um, and that was I was lucky enough to have a PE teacher who was a rower at the time. And they were running a pioneer talent identification program through the Australian Institute of Sport. And um, uh, Professor Alan Hahn at the time uh, and his team were looking to select um, 12 girls and 12 boys who'd never rode before and take them on the journey to try and make them, I think, be competitive at a national championships. And that was a really exciting way to learn how to row. Um, being 16, it was sort of a sport that I had finally chosen. It wasn't a sport that my parents had put me into. It was something that I could make the decision to be a part of. And um, just going through that, there's not many opportunities that you have where you get to experience a sport um, collectively with another group of people where you're all learning together. And, um, and being 16 and it was just a lot of fun. And that's where Tomo first came to coach me. Um, so Tomo and I've got a pretty unique journey in the fact that Tomo took me from rowing illiterate through to um, Olympic Games podium. So um, yeah, it was a pretty exciting sort of journey to be on. That's really incredible. I didn't realise that you had spent so time, uh, so long actually, such a long time um, working together. And so I guess that takes me into Tomo. How did you transition from being an athlete into coaching and end up coaching the Talent ID squad, which I think was the first rowing Talent ID squad at the AIS? Yeah, that was a pilot program that, that Megan, um, Megan uh, described there and yeah there was Alan Hahn and Peter Shakespeare again and and Reinhold and and they had the scholarship coaching um apprentice coaching there so I, I'd done my rowing my rowing bit and um uh I got knocked off my push bike and then I thought I'd better go back and finish my degree and start looking for a real job and uh Reinhold and Peter said why don't you come down and start coaching and of course they were six months <coughs> six months scholarships and um they used it for the talent ID and claimed that I was a slow learner, so I still needed to come back um, for for three for three go for three goes at it. But that, that like with Megan as a as a rower, you know, as a as a young coach and not so much young, uh, so much older than these guys, um, it was a wonderful opportunity to um, to just be working in such a, a vibrant place. Um, you know, we used to end up. Uh, there's um, Alan Hart had shut the the door of the the gym and then we'd all, of, of his lab and then we'd all get in there and do do cross training and different things into the into the evening and you know the there was it was um, you could just feel that people wanted you to succeed whether that was from the physios or the doctors or the sports science and and the same amongst the you know the rowers down there and it's it was a wonderful opportunity that that Ryan Alden and Peter and and Alan certainly gave gave me absolutely and I guess then uh fast forwarding only a few years so what was that 1989 that the program I think ran and and then fast forwarding a few years and you're coaching at your first Olympic Games and I think quite often it's easy you know particularly when you've had long and illustrious careers to uh, kind of gloss over all of the ups and downs and, and some of the the things that happen in the journey but for you Megan and Kate um, can you tell us a little bit about that transition I guess from um, starting out rowing and finding the sport and I guess when that switch kind of flicked and, and you decided that maybe going to the Olympic games was something that was achievable or a goal for you, Kate? So I guess I had a year of being social and fun and then I get, I jumped on the ergo. I somehow managed to fall off it. So ergos and me were never um, on the same basis. Rod Elloway had that. But I was really lucky. I went to Sassy uh, quite early on and I got coached by Robin Gray Gardner and she won an Olympic bronze medal back in 84. And I remember her just, she used to pick me up because I didn't have, I couldn't drive a car at that stage and my, my parents weren't going to get up at 4.30 in the morning to take me down to West Lakes. And Robin would just sit there on this really cold morning. I just remember her saying really simply, it's just simple. You just got to think of a really narrow rectangle. Just put your blade in as far out as you can reach, pull it through flat, exit it, and then just come straight forward. And I just thought, how hard can rowing be? <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> 
I then was, and then I guess Sassy didn't have the women they had, they're focusing more on lightweights. And through Sassy, they actually supported me and said, well, why don't you go to Strange to the Sport? And what I didn't realize is they already had seven scholarships. I just thought, great, a weekend, never been to Canberra. I'm going to go and check it out. <laughs> and I went with like a weekend's worth of stuff to go on scholarship. And I was against girls who had got, you know, world championships um, behind them or junior world championship medals. And I thought, I haven't got a chance, but hey, this is great fun. And then Tom at the end of the weekend said, how do you fancy staying? And I'm like, but I've got no gear. And he said, well, just stay until Christmas and you've got a scholarship. And I got put with Megan. I think Megan was the last one of the seven because you were like the, the young one and the talented identification person. And I was, and we both rode bow side. So Tom and his wisdom um, put us, and, and I think I came from a sport of rowing and running. I... I did have some great coaching from Robin, but I think the biomechanist at the time when she saw Megan and I, A, I just swapped sides. I was trying to steer the boat, so hadn't steered a different side of the boat in a pair. And um, I think Peggy actually said to Tom, are those two seriously on scholarship? I don't think we look particularly good by the biomechanist perspective anyway. So, you know, I guess I came in pretty raw as well. And, you know, very early on, you know, Tomo grabbed an amazing team around him as well and also he's got a great coaching background. I had 10 years as as my coach. And, you know, there are moments where, you know, he pushed pushed you further than what you believed you could do and I guess that's always a coach-athlete relationship. But always the trust was there, the trust that I would always get the best possible con- um, position and condition at every event that I needed to. And... Um, yeah, you know, amazing support. You know, Alan Hahn and the, the physios, the physiotherapists, um, the psychologists, um, you know, even down to the dietitian, Louise Burke, and, you know, the whole Australian Institute of Sport. You know, we had Marilyn always on reception. I mean, it's just a team behind you. I mean, you as the athlete, you know, we get to be there on the start line, but it's such a privilege to have all the support. And that's why I think, Tomo, you know, you're great at always, you're instrumental at always getting an amazing team around us. So, yeah, I was in great hands and I got to row a boat and I guess we started to look all right after a while. <laughs> and we started, going, we started, I think, Tommy, you said, oh, maybe you should just aim for under 23, the match, just, the, 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 the thing between New Zealand and Australia. And the first thing was, oh, maybe we should just set your standards realistically. Oh, maybe we'll just go for the under 23s. And look, you know, if you, however you go is however you go. And I'm thinking, okay. I thought, oh, and I saw there was Vienna World Championships. And I'm thinking, I've never been to Europe. I think I'd like to go to Vienna. And so I'm like going, no, no, let's just go for the open group. And um, Tommy, uh, you know, you actually did back that because originally everyone just thought we were, you know, Megan's talented vacation. You know, I was only fairly new to the sport one year, perhaps of social rowing and a little bit of sassy time. But, you know, to allow us, and we came second, I think, at the final selection regatta and um, went to seat racing. And um, we ended up, you know, Megan being... Meg and I both in the women's four that went to the world championships. So I guess our trajectory within one year was pretty incredible. It was also a, um, like at that time, there'd been no women go to Seoul from Australia. Yeah. And, and so it's, um, and obviously there was a success of, of 84 and, and, and of 1980 as, um, as well. So there was, um, so that's why, you know, we really wanted to to have a have a push to to um, uh, push the women um, up, up to that up to that level, and there weren't so many role models around mm. around either. So it really was starting starting and, and building building something. Yeah, that's it's amazing because you know unfortunately I don't think that's the only time where where women's rowing in Australia particularly has gone through that that cycle although things I think are in a, in a very different place now so um, it it is incredibly difficult where you don't have like you say those role models and and that pathway to follow and and to be able to I guess set your sights on on that team and think no we're going to be part of it Megan was it the same for you you know when did that realization happen that you know going to Vienna or going to the Olympics was something within grasp in only such a short time frame um, well, I certainly, definitely agree with Kate's description. We were pretty much the leftovers thrown together. <laughs> I remember feeling quite dismayed that all the other girls knew each other quite well and it all paired up and 
um, you know, sort of your first term going from, I was, went to 1990 Junior World Championships out of the talent identification program and then transitioned into the AIS as a senior, into the senior program. And as Kate said, I just remember Tomo saying to us, you know, um, I think you should aim for under 23s. And if I think back, that was for me almost the turning of the key to go, no way. <laughs> Uh, I think we're being pretty competitive when we train with the others. And I think for Kate and I, that was something that was always one of our strengths is we were um, always had pretty high expectations of ourselves. And um, even back in those early years, like um, Tomo saying to us, um, you should row under 23s. When I think it was particularly because all the other girls um, within the squad were rowing senior. We didn't want to be the only crew that was rowing under 23. So... Um, I think it sort of really started for us. We weren't pretty <laughs> by any means. <laughs> and I was not a natural by any means. Um, yeah, I still can remember Tomo saying things to me when I first started rowing about, you know, <laughs> my technique and, um, you know, spending plenty of time when I'd just be in the boat trying to do circle work by myself with the crew and um, fine tune my technique. <laughs> Um, but, uh, definitely I think fairly early on, um, Kate and I were quite determined from a national perspective to do quite well and that opened up the opportunities and I think in 1992 we were just really lucky as Tom and I were saying, they were looking to support women. We didn't, um, I think we had to qualify through Lucerne, um, to actually get the boat classified from memory so it was a bit of a journey to actually even get to the games um and then it was the excitement of being in the olympic games and all that has to offer as a really um young rowers that hadn't been on the scene for very long and um i can still remember sort of the goal was just to make the final um and we were happy with that we were happy to make the final and that was the goal and just to be able to take in the whole olympic game experience and um we were lucky enough at that time to march and soak up that atmosphere. And so I think when we came back, you know, four years later, the experience was quite different. We'd had that opportunity to have that underneath our belt. And in 1996, when we sort of um, came to Atlanta, we'd, we'd um much different story um, in terms of our approach to it and, and the boat that we were rowing in, but um, had a brilliant time in 1992 in the fall. Absolutely. And Tomo, what were you going to say? say <clears throat> it's a real sliding doors moment uh, because Megan mentioned Lucerne in uh, 92 and um, uh, for me I, I feel in my my coaching career that was a sliding doors moment and I suspect um, for Kate and Megan as well so you, we had to qualify for the final to, um, uh, to for the so that this was pre we're all starting to show our age this is pre uh, having qualification regattas so you had a grading committee from the Australian Olympic Committee and the standard was the top six. Um, so in the repercharge, had to come first or second. And, um, uh, and you know, the regatta, it wasn't as well communicated as it was. So Reinhold was down at the finish line. David Yates was down at the finish line, you know, the head selector. And it was the repercharge, first two into the final, not you're on the plane home. And uh, I was about 750 metres from the finish. And of course, we're in third position about, about a, canvas, a canvas down. I think, here we go. All the Olympics is gone for the sake of, you know, five, five feet. And I could hear this flurry of things at the, um, coming in towards the finish. And it was all in, in German and, you know, you're new to it. And then they crossed the line and, uh, and David Yates comes through, optimist. Um, yeah, Tomo, yeah, yeah, yeah. They got it, you know, da, 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 through the radio. And then you hear... Not so fast. I don't think so. <laughs> from from Ronald. And so then there's ten ten minutes. And of course, yeah, of course came came through and came through um I think it was the French crew that had Christine Gosser in it, who uh, is now the, the French national team coach and, and raced in the pairs in ninety six as well. And and you know, I, I'm sure if, if that had have gone the other way and we were on our, uh, our, our plane back to, to Canberra, then 96 wouldn't have been the same way for, for any of us. And, and so I know you make your own luck and, you know, you guys made my luck. 
um, in that last 750 meters is you made your own your own luck to come come through there so I really saw that as a pivotal point in in what we're all doing now as well and just on that Tomo you know there's always that sort of argument particularly with young athletes you know do we select crews for experience um, or do we select them based on a on a medal standard for example and and clearly it seems like sending the women's four and, and attempting to qualify it and going to the games as Megan spoke about was hugely beneficial in terms of what happened four years later. Yeah, absolutely. But there was still a hard standard there that we knew we had to meet. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so it's still, you know, it may, may not be a medal, but it's not so far away, uh, so far away from it. So, um, so there's still a standard there to meet, but yeah. And, you know, talented athletes are talented athletes. Yes, absolutely. And speaking of that talent, um, I guess you finished the 92 Olympics. What then was the process in terms of ultimately getting down to the pair? And after you finished Barcelona, because you, you went away in the four, I think again, the following year, um, were you always, I guess, having an eye on the pair or was it thinking about maybe pursuing the four or, or going to the eight? What, what kind of conversations and what was going um, through your head um, at that point in time? Do you think we get to choose which pair? I mean, we don't, <laughs> we don't often get to choose. I mean, I think, I don't know about you, Migs, but I love the four. I love the team uh, dynamic. We've done the four for the previous two years. We've done the eight. The eight was amazing and a really good experience, but I really loved, um, it felt personable in the four. And so that was definitely my, my favourite boat. So we went away to um, to Czech Republic and then we found out the following year they had switched, the, the pair then had been dropped from the Olympic Games programme. So it was the four and the eight going forward to Atlanta. So we obviously went for the four. And then we hear as soon as that event had finished it, that they actually switched it and it was now the pair and the eight and the four are gone. Um, and so, yeah, you naturally then have to make a change of, right, we're going for the pair or we're going for the eight. Um, and, you know, I don't always think as athletes, we always get to select the boats we want to be in. Um, you've got to be in the right position. And I think Meigs and I just went, let's go for it. And... You know, I think Tomo very rightly and what Meg said, I remember the Lucerne, you know, we really did rate 40 the whole way down the track. It was pretty much like an egg beta to make that final position to make top six that the Australian Olympic Committee had required of us. And we went and shook. I remember being at the Barcelona Olympics and I shook every medalist's hand. And I thought, I'm coming back in four years. Don't know what boat. Well, at that stage, I thought it was a four. But, you know, we went and started training hard, put our heads down and we just went for it. And initially we made the eight the following year. So it was a four in uh, 93. Then we went to the eight. Um, and then it was only the next year, uh, the, in 95, we got into the pair, which was a qualification year when they brought the qualification system in by FISA and the IOC respectively. And um, we had our little uh, hiccups that year. Um, I broke my foot. <laughs> I went onto the plane in crutches. <laughs> I remember because I wasn't the best at ergo. So I think what I found really, I love being on the water. Give me a training program. Give me selection, seat racing. I loved it. Put me on an ergo. Meigs was incredible. Meigs at the time, I think, had you had the world record, I think, for a period of time for the 2K or 2.5K ergo. Meigs was, you know, got the bottle, you know, all the weightlifting coaches said, oh, no, heroic and, you know, clean that sort of weight. And Meigs, of course, would go and smash that out of the park. So we're quite different. I mean, I had a real endurance base, I guess, a feel, and I didn't have the power that or the ergo. So when I had this broken foot, I know, Tomo, you were the head coach at the time, Simon Gillett, said, oh, you've got to swap, you know, the top ergo person in, I think. And it's there is a combination of raw power and how well you move a boat. So if you don't have the best ergo, never, ever give up. I definitely didn't have anywhere near the top ergos, but I always loved being in the water and I made it every stroke I did count. So um, we went in with a bit of an up and down 95 season. And I remember racing in 95 and it's like, where are the other, I can see all the crews, what's going on? There's five crews behind us. I'm sitting out here and it's feeling really easy. And there's five crews in the final um, and we're winning. It's like, now what do we do? I mean, there was this <laughs> surreal moment of, my God, we're winning. Um, so it, it first happened in the CERN. So, I mean, you know, the World Cup. And I remember thinking, oh, maybe it's just a one-off. But you just keep going about the right process. And I guess that's where, you know, the programmer on that Tomo had had us always perfectly aligned for each race and deliver the best we could. 
out of ourselves each time. And, you know, 95 was magic. I mean, it was a washout in Tampere. It rained nonstop. Um, but it was just magical. And, you know, I guess we fell in love with a pair and it was a privilege to be, you know, selected in it. And Megan, you were you were world champions in 95, as Kate's described. Did you then feel, I guess, a real burden going into 96? And did you feel pressure to then back up um, with the Olympic gold medal in sight? Um, for sure. Um, we, um, we were like, actually, we were lucky enough in 1994 when we were part of a four, we'd won our first medal in um, the four um, with Tori Toogood and Alison Davies. Um, and that was a brilliant four. Um, and we got a bronze medal at the World Championships. Um, so we sort of had a great sort of springboard from there. Um, and as Kate said, um, fantastic to have that win in 1995. And I think there was a few other things that were thrown into the mix too, Kate. I think I had pneumonia. <laughs> and there was a few other things that happened too with that little journey. Um, but yeah, it definitely was a different feeling going from being an underdog to then having to back up and perform at a World Cup leading into the Games. And I think it really did affect us. We didn't really know how to respond to that feeling and we did feel the pressure. And we probably, in, for me, in hindsight, looking back, and I know um, we sort of worked through that process and that was, I guess, one of our strengths, I think, over the, having the opportunity to row together with um, a crew for such an extended period of time, the dynamic between the coach and um the athletes um we knew each other quite well and even though we'd have our highs and lows you know we could sort of work through the processes um and yeah the world cups from memory leading up to the games we really had a few that we we sort of lost our mojo and <laughs> didn't have our confidence and started to doubt ourselves a little bit um and i think in hindsight for me looking back it was that pressure of having to perform and, and to deal with the other side of it how do you um, not be afraid of that pressure and kind of confront it and talk about, well, what's the worst that can happen? And then sort of, um, I guess we definitely had to go through that journey a little bit to sort of reset ourselves and be on the right path for the Games. And Tomo, for you, I guess this is reaching one of the um, first major moments of, of your coaching career. You know, you've got this world champion crew who, who had the potential to win an Olympic gold medal. How did you handle the pressure yourself, but also help to handle the pressure um, for your athletes and, and I guess manage, manage them through to the Games? Yeah, it's the, the magic in rowing is what you do every day in training. And, and, you know, your training underpins what your performance is. And as Kate and Megan have said before, they, they really um, put themselves right out there every day. And um, when I look back on that, and Kate's raised this with me before, she reckons I'm getting softer. <laughs> um, you know, I, I did, I did um, think up some pretty horrendous workloads that they managed to, uh, to get through. So, it, um, you know, you can, you can refine things as you go, go along, but, uh, you know, to, you couldn't ask for... Um, a better crew to try things like because it was new it was pretty much new for all of us and of course we had our our support and, and athletes around the, the squad and you know as Kate and Megan said there's been, there was some very good good athletes um, around in that squad so they had to be on the toes to be ahead of that and you know the support that we've mentioned before um, around the AIS and, and so, you know, it was really experimenting what worked and what, what, what didn't work. And, you know, it, it came, came good in the end, but it was definitely, definitely up, up and down as we, as we went along. Yes, of course. And I think I was talking to one of my friends um, yesterday, in fact, who's a, a Winter Olympian and man, some of the stuff they do is crazy, but um, we were talking about how often when you're starting out on your journey, you think it's just going to be this linear progression and, and it turns out to be anything but it's a complete roller coaster um, all the way through as you've already given us some insights into. But speaking of roller coasters, let's fast forward to the Olympic Games, the Olympic final, but specifically the night before the Olympic final. Uh, it was a pretty interesting time. Megan, do you want to give us a bit of a rundown about what happened in Atlanta? Um, 
Well, I think one of the strengths, as Kate sort of mentioned, um, certainly with with um, Tomo, who always surrounded us with a really good team. We had a um, great support network and we did focus on a lot of things that I think really helped us. And some of those things were we were really good planners. We had good day plans um, and we were quite um, good at, I remember that the night before the bags were packed, we were ready for the final. Um, and then we had our day plan down to, you know, what time we'd be waking up and going to breakfast and, and you know, uh, I can't remember what the, the wake up time was, but I remember sort of thinking when we had this knock on the door at about 5.30 that that wasn't on the day plan and, <laughs> you know, that's not the way you want to start the, the day of the Olympic grand final. Um, uh, from memory, as I said, I think we had our bags packed so we could just grab our bags and get out. I can't remember, Kate, whether we had to go back for yours or... <laughs> no, before I am, darling. Yes. I think it was 4 o'clock in the morning, I, not 5.30. I, I had five. to go back for yours. I'm going back there <laughs> thinking I'm going to die for a kit, smelly kit. <laughs> Anyhow, what, what was good about it was um, I think through the, the highs and lows of, of the previous years, we had come up with our own strategies and ways of sort of focusing in for the day and, you know, dealing with the what ifs. That was one, you know, another really good trait of what Tomo had brought us into was using psychologists and that to help us in terms of building resilience and strategies to deal with different scenarios. And we'd definitely done that sort of what if. And we hadn't done the what if there's a bomb threat, but we could sort of be resilient enough to kind of go, okay, that's extra time for us to go carbo load, have a few extra bananas, that'll make us go faster. So we could kind of turn the page a little bit pretty quickly on that one and not feel too frazzled by it. I love that. A little bit more time to, to get prepared and we'll go faster. That's such a great lesson. Actually, this has been a bit of a theme throughout these talks on the COVID situation and how to turn this situation into an opportunity um, in in many respects, um, so I'm not sure, Kate, if, if you're if you're feeling that with the homeschooling, how's that all going for you at the moment? And have you been able to take, I guess, some of those lessons in? <laughs> Massive respect for teachers. <laughs> but I mean, I think also on that final day, I mean, it was sitting there and turning that negative into a positive. And I, you know, the COVID thing, and I definitely think of all the athletes. Um, I've spoken to a few, but you know everyone's going through this and definitely to make it turn it you know I guess it's being grateful being grateful for where we are right now and just being in the moment and just just enjoy each day as it comes who knows what's going to come forward but um I do remember Tommy having two wrong shoes on that morning so we, gonna... went to, we went to tell the media <laughs> that was that was brilliant so we'd gone through the whole day and Alex it was he, he we're doing the interview after the race and he said um so I heard you had to get up early this morning. And and we'd all, because we, the final was on the Saturday and we, we didn't want to make a big deal out of the, the bomb threat because we still had crews racing on the Sunday. And so we said, we you know, mum's the word. So um, I said, oh, no more than usual and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he said, oh, don't worry, Tomo, um, Reinhold's told us, you know, we're not going to do anything, da, 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 da. And then he said, but you, I'll come back to you. Um, you must have got out of bed early this morning. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, look down. And I had one Asex on and one Adidas shoe on. Because, of course, when Andy Guerin came around knocking on the door, it was right where are they? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, it, so it panned out all day. How embarrassing. <laughs> oh, that's, that's all right. That's the worst thing that happened. <laughs> all the other squads had a lot different, uh, harder position than us because we were prepared for the next day because we were racing. But... I remember some of the girls coming down literally in sheets with just their night clothes on because, you know, it's four o'clock in the morning and they, you know, they had to send the fireman in or someone in to go and get their underwear or, you know, it was quite a surreal experience at the time, sitting there on the concrete, mm. you know, wondering what the hell day of the Olympic final. Yeah, absolutely. And the strength of that team, Australia topped the medal table in 96. And mm. I think... That may be Australia's most successful day of racing at the Olympics still. You just preempted my next question, Tomo. That's exactly what I was going to ask about. Came straight after straight after that. And, you know, it was a it was it really was a fabulous team to, to, to be a part of. 
um, you know, with the awesome foursome back on back on song. Um, these guys winning the year before. We had Rob Scott and Dave in the in the pair. We had a, a fabulous uh, fabulous men's quad and the lightweight. Uh, lightweight, uh, both lightweight doubles, uh, doubles medaled, and um, we didn't get to go to the uh, opening opening ceremony, so we put it on ourselves. And seeing um, seeing Noel Donaldson and Harold Jarling dressed as Roman in Roman togas, I, I drove across two states. I had to go and get the fireworks, so I drove across two <laughs> states to to pick the fireworks up. I've got this big bear cannon. I can remember it now. And as I was leaving, the the woman said, "Where, where did you say you were from?" Is it over there? She said, well, if you get pulled up, just don't tell them where you got it from, will you? So, um, you know, it was just all the way, all the way through. It was a fabulous team to, to be a part of. Lucky that everyone got to the Olympic finals with their fingers and toes by the sounds of it. Um, but, uh, Kate, for you, what was that like to be a part of Australia's most successful Olympic rowing team? And did the team have a real, I guess, confidence or buzz about it? Was there that ex- expectation it would go that well? Um, we've been through a really rough year beforehand. So I think Australian rowing had gone bankrupt. Is that correct? Or we, anyway, finances were limited. We're staying in youth hostels. And what I really recall was actually how we all pulled together. I remember the coaches like Tim McLaren and Tomo and a whole lot of, you know, Noel, anyone that all team together and they'd have to only have limited um, speed boats. And so they'd actually all have to often coach together or rotate round. So it just brought the team like I've never seen together. So sometimes not having money or not having the facilities actually can be to your advantage. So definitely in times of hardship, like even now, you know, how does it pull a whole squad together? So yeah, you know, and also the women's squad. I mean, talk about how we do well. It is really everyone that's behind us. Like, I remember always, Tom would have the four women's pairs out there. I remember particularly Gina and Jenny. They're incredible. They're always just behind us. So when you have a successful crew, there's always a crew literally right on their tails. And they were exceptional. Um, I'm sure they probably would have meddled as well. Like, they were amazing. And then the rest of the squad wasn't far behind there. So, you know, they're part of the eight. Um, there was, you know, it was great to be part of the team and everyone was just, um, I don't know, was there a buzz? It was just like, we were staying in a military camp. Um, so, in, um, so we weren't staying part of the Olympic Village. We literally had, I remember them being wire beds that came off the wall onto the ground. I don't know if you remember that, Meg, but I just remember literally sleeping inches away from you. And then we really was no space in this place. It was pretty basic. And then there was a guy that um, played the trumpet every morning at dawn and at dusk and it was just unique which is we were just moving as a unit and everyone had each other's back so I think it was just a very supportive unit and it was just amazing to be part of like it felt like everyone was getting stronger because we were looking out for each other so yeah I loved it 96 uh, probably was the best team I've been on um, 92 was innocence you know of making the team and 2000 was different because obviously change a partner and you know, um, a home Olympics. And it just felt more, I guess, spread out, ironically, even though it was in a home country. So for me, 96 was definitely, um, you know, something I'll never forget, you know, just fantastic characters, lots of skits, um, lots of in-house uh, pranks. I think the, um, I remember a lot of the, everyone was doing pranks on someone, so it's a great team dynamic. So really fun to be part of. Yeah, it sounds like an amazing team and, and, no surprise, I guess that success flowed from that kind of dynamic and, and some of those personalities in it as well. And Megan, I guess this might be a little bit hard to to answer from your perspective, but do you have, I guess, um, or do you, do you have a concept of, or do you think back um, about the impact that what you guys achieved in terms of winning Australia's first women's Olympic gold medal, what that's had on, I guess, female rowers who have come through and, and on the sport in Australia more broadly, or is that something that I guess um, you're a little removed from? Um, I feel like I'm, well, I feel a little bit removed from it. I'm always pleasantly surprised if anyone sort of invites us to come along and speak to them or share your stories and quite humbled by that, you know, that I guess our own experiences might be beneficial for others. But as Tomo mentioned before, it was a difficult time for us going through that we didn't necessarily have those people that were just ahead of us um, that we could sort of mentor us in a way. And um, as 
Kate mentioned as well, we're always really blessed that we had really strong competition um, nationally, had really great um, competitors from a female's pers perspective um, that we would be training with daily um, and they were part of the national squad as well. So no, not so much about that. Um, uh, I guess it's probably maybe years down the track that you sort of realise po possibly, you know, the achievement and... Um, put it in perspective um we were actually really lucky too for both Kate and I that was the one time that we had our whole family there to watch us at the games um so both of our families were there and I for, for me my parents had never sort of seen me sort of compete internationally and we were lucky enough to go to a few world championships and um so to have them actually there to cross the finish line, not know whether we'd actually won or not. It was so close. Um, took us moments to actually sort of, you know, just waiting, staring up at the um, scoreboard to sort of see where the names fell. And, um, you know, took us probably a minute or so afterwards to actually register that we'd actually um, had won because it was quite a close race. So um, certainly lots of special memories that were tied up with the actual race. And I think too, the conditions were such good conditions for racing. We'd had a really fast time and um, we were really lucky in so many ways um, on the day to have such great conditions to race and be able to pull it all together and have that performance. So um, now always honoured if you have the opportunity to sort of share your experiences and there's something within that that people can sort of take away. And um, yeah, I, definitely lucky within my role at the moment um, within sport that I can sort of, I guess, pull on those memories to sort of help me when I'm sort of talking and working with athletes and coaches to kind of understand the stresses and the strains that they're under. Absolutely. And I always remember when I was working at the AIS as a tour guide early on in my career and your pair used to be strung up um, from the roof, the Alan Hahn, and under it there was um, a picture of you guys racing and I always remember that you had some pretty interesting hats on um, that you <laughs> raced with in the Olympic final. Is there a story behind the hats which aren't Australian Olympic team issue hats? <laughs> I don't know how we got away with wearing those. I mean, we <laughs> had to wear them in the final. Did we? Yeah, oh, we did. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I think we really got uh, present with the pressure and the the roller coaster ride of just enjoying it and really mm -hmm. just in, being in the moment and enjoying the ride. And I remember Meg's just turning up really, she'd gone shopping and she came and go, I've got us, I've got us a present. And she brought out these caps and they literally had, they had Mickey Mouse. They're like te teal and purple with Mickey Mouse on them. Literally they've got Mickey yeah. Mouse. <laughs> and you said, this is us having fun on the, at the Olympics. How we got to wear those, they did put tape on. Like when we went down the dock, they taped us all up because you're not meant to have sponsors. We weren't sponsored by Disney. It was just purely, you know, we were just, that was going with the moment that Meigs had brought something and said, this is us, this is us enjoying the moment. And um, yeah, we raced in Mickey Mouse hats. I, th I think it really was a part of um, those years, um, the year leading up prior where we'd have sort of probably a few more um, things hadn't gone maybe as well as we'd liked in some of the World Cups. We'd sort of been on this bit of a journey of just rediscovering ourselves and our confidence and we really arrived at the back of well you know what do we enjoy about the sport and to really um i guess find that um being grateful in the opportunity and really loving the fact that you you know you've you're just surrounded by the world's best and you're you've got this opportunity to race the world's best and how exciting is that um and just really see um the opportunity for what it was and embrace that. And I think that's what the hats were all about, was about just celebrating and having fun and enjoying those moments because rather than having the pressure just override the moment and not feel like you can be at your best. And that was trying to put us in the right headspace um, to be able to perform at our best and um, deliver what we felt, I think, in our hearts, if we pulled off the race we'd intended to have, that we would be in a really strong position to sort of take out the race and um, we just wanted to be able to be mentally in that space that we could perform at our best and yeah absolutely and Tomo that for you um, I guess then springboarded into 
an incredible career coaching um, in Britain. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and, and your time in GB and now um, over in China? Yeah, it's, um, I, I still pinch myself to be fair um, because it's, it's um, um, you know, it all started with these guys and, and especially with, uh, with Megan right at the very, at the very beginning. And um, the full circle uh, bit of all that is um, with the talent ID, they took t- that with Peter Shakespeare to the UK and, and that's where Helen Glover, um, Heather Stanning, so, and uh, Anna Watkins, which were all part of Britain's first female gold medals uh, at um, at uh, London. And, you know, for me as a coach, my, my squad won three golds and two silvers, and I'm still grumpy about the two silvers. Um, you know, we had a, a strong team, similar to what we're dis- dis- discussing for, for 96. And so, you know, that's been... Uh, that's been what, what I feel really... Um, pleased about is I've been able to be part of a developing system in Australia, a developing system in Britain, and uh, and that's hence why why the Chinese have, have got me over over here. So, yeah, it's uh, been a life a life on the uh, on the riverbank, I, I guess, but not one one I'd swap. It's been a, a fabulous journey. Well, it's certainly been amazing watching the developments in Chinese women's rowing, particularly in the success of the quad at Henley last year and, and at the World Championships and World Cups. So uh, we wish you all the very best with that, although, you know, not, not too much luck because, of course, we want to see the green and gold flying down the course, but uh, we do wish you all the very best um, as you move forward with China. But we now move on to our fast five, which is our last five questions of the interview, and I'll go through each of you um, with each of these questions. So we'll start with what's your favorite rowing course to row on, Megan? Oh gosh. Um, gee, that's a tricky one. I mean, Lucerne is so beautiful, <laughs> but then Tasmania is fantastic. Tasmania, I mean, Australia's got so many beautiful courses as well. So I think um, definitely like um, Tasmania, sort of the course like Barrington is fantastic really love that course and um, I think as an Australian team we we're really lucky to have quite a big periods of time where we were based in Lucerne um, and just have really fond memories of that course as well um, so they're probably my two. Absolutely and of course the Nationals in Tassie um, actually next year so we'll hopefully all get to enjoy that then. Um, Kate your favourite course? Um I've got to be patriotic. I'd say Adelaide, but it's not a proper <laughs> tournament. No no it's short, but internationally, I think whilst Lucerne is beautiful, I think for me, um, when Megan and I just went back to basics and found why we're doing the love of sport in 96, when we hadn't won anything and we had the pressure on us, I love um, Amsterdam. Because we went back there and we just had the innocence of why we did the sport. So I, that to me is that was my turning moment of, I just want to love it. There's nothing else. I just want to love what I do and enjoy and be so grateful. So I love that course. Nice. Tomo? Okay. Well, yeah, you've got all those picturesque ones. Lucerne, Bled, uh, Barrington, uh, Ferrazzi. But I narrowed it down to Dorney and Sydney. Because out of my experiences, those have had the best crowds, the best yeah. crowds to be racing in front of, the noisiest, the, the ones with the best, the best nature, and uh, they were a dead heat. Nice. All right, next question. Top track to erg to or maybe your silence when you erg? Tomo, we'll start with you. Oh, I'm getting too old for that. I, I'm quite. I've got <laughs> such an after listening to so much music over agometers. I've got such an eclectic mix on my uh, my playlist. I, I won't even start. Oh, okay, too many, too many choices. But it's going to be a, it'll, no. Well, to be fair, it'll be an Australian um, pub uh, pub group, probably Midnight Oil. <laughs> nice. Showing my nice. showing my age. Actually, I think someone else said that. I think. I'm, Oh, I can't remember. One of our younger athletes definitely gave Midnight Oil, though, and asked if maybe Pete Garrett's dancing got them got them ready to go on the erg. I'm not sure if that would be a good technique. But, uh, Kate, you? I, oh, 
I think I had the eclectic taste. Um, I just liked to read a good beat, so I used to listen to a lot of Gatecrasher. <laughs> so, <laughs> after that ministry is down, sort of stuff. So I didn't have a particular track. I just like to lose myself in the beat. If I had to do an ergo, I, I actually wanted to get, if they have those ear pods now, though, I think I'd be wearing those in training to kind of maybe wash out some of the coaching dulcet tones, but we didn't have those back then. Megan? Oh, no. Uh, sorry, I missed this intel that I had to have this prepared. Um, <laughs> I think Tomoy used to always give me a hard time about listening to some sort of funk music, but um, I think I just had, <laughs> I was pretty sort of a eclectic taste too, didn't have a particular band that I liked, much the same as Kate, anything that had a bit of a beat. Um, look, I, I think I'd probably even show my age. I think I might have even had a soundtrack to Michael Jackson somewhere along the <laughs> <laughs> line. I can't say that it was my favourite, but you know, it was anything that had a bit of a beat. Um, and we used to love having music when we're in the gym, working out as well. Um, so I always remember sort of having the music um, pumping pretty hard in there and enjoying that atmosphere as, um, as well as when we had other opportunities to have it on. Yep, totally agree. Um, the best piece of advice you've been given, Kate, we'll go to you. Um... Can I, can I <laughs> go to the others and I'll come back? I was, okay, we'll come back to Kate. Tomo. <laughs> uh, don't F it up as you're pushing off to go and race. <laughs> <laughs> you did too. That was, that was uh, yeah, because now's not the time to do it. Uh, no, I didn't give that advice. I was given that advice. <laughs> right, no, you look, um, look, I think in our, in our sport, um, Perseverance and resilience uh, are two fundamental characters that you really, you really need to, to do. And as we've discussed today, you know, you really need to per persevere day in, day out. That's, that's part of our sport and some of the qualities that you do. And you do have your ups and downs. You need to be, you need to be resilient. Yeah, absolutely. Great advice. Megan? Um, I don't know if I've ever... Um, like Tomo had lots of phrases I think he used to throw out of it <laughs> like you know kiss yeah. keep it simple stupid and I'm sure there was like quite a few that used to sort of but I think it was really about um for me you know trying to enjoy the processes so if you can because it's all about the processes so if you can find pleasure in enjoying the processes then success is going to be multiplied um and for me that's sort of what it was about, the journey was a bit about yep Kate? I, I do recall, Tommy, your classic one in Barcelona. That's not my favourite, though, but it was when we had made the final because we couldn't even believe we made the final of Barcelona. I think you said if you beat three people, you win the bronze medal. If you beat four, you'll get the silver. If you beat five, you'll get the gold. <laughs> uh, I do recall that one. I think it might have been Reinhold then said, oh, don't worry, Kate, the whole girls, the whole world's watching you with that. I started throwing up. So not my finest <laughs> moments. Um, I think what I would say now... Um, is enjoy every moment and I think and celebrate all the small things celebrate the sessions celebrate the things along the way I think I was always too focused on where we're getting to rather than just being in the moment of just where we currently are and there are ups and downs and every time there's a down there's a breakthrough coming around the corner that is excellent advice particularly to our younger athletes that are listening and and watching this uh, career highlight it says to date, but it could be your sporting career or it could also be in your work life, your career post-sport. Megan, do you have a career highlight? Oh, look, I don't think we could go past the fact of being able to actually um, culminate in our journey together as a team, uh, winning an Olympic gold medal um, in 1996 and having, as I said, my, our whole family is there to share in that moment and... Um, I think we've sort of mentioned along the way that um, we certainly appreciate the team behind the team and the people that made that possible for us. And um, I think your support network as an athlete is so important and um, that role that your family and your friends play is significant um, along the journey. So to have those people there to witness that experience um, and be able to perform as you hoped you might be able to, um, certainly the sweetest pain in the neck that I've ever experienced having that Olympic gold medal around my neck. <laughs> and um, I remember Kate and I having 
quite comical scenes after the event, sort of talking about, well, what's the protocol? Do you keep it on? Do you take it off? Do you <laughs> sleep in it? You know, all those fun moments where it's just slowly starting to sink in that you've actually achieved this goal that you've been striving for, you know, for quite a long period of time. Yeah, so incredible. Kate, I, I'm guessing it's probably going to be similar, but what's your career highlight? It was that winning that goal. And I think Megan probably woke up the next, that day after we won at 4am a similar time. And I think she said, pinch me, am I dreaming or did it actually happen? Um, it is completely like, I think daring to dream, you know, really going out there and having a go. Um, I love the Olympic gold medal. I love every time I put the green and gold on. If I think back to just a really simple thing was, I remember getting my South Australian suit and it was really shiny, didn't fit me, it was baggy. And I remember wearing it the whole time around the house because I was so excited to get a uniform. So getting that green and gold or getting that representation when you get to represent, it's such a privilege. And just enjoy every time you get one of any outfit you, you've earned, enjoy that moment. Yeah, that's such great advice. Um, and Tomo, for you, career highlight, you've had so many. Uh, well, they've all, the outco- they've all been the outcomes, haven't they? And, yeah. and uh, I just feel it's an absolute privilege to have worked with so many fabulous athletes. And, and to me, that's the highlight. And, and seeing how fast you can make them row and you'll live up and down through, through that. But, you know, that's for a short time. You know, I've been really fortunate with, with Megan for eight years, Kate for 10 years, Coach Catherine Granger for 15 years. And, and you know, those, those long long-term relationships are, are, are really, really valuable. And then to see, you know, how they, they, they've progressed and given things back to the sport, had families and all of that stuff. It's just a, a huge highlight and a privilege for a coach. Of course, we're, you know, going to be competitive and want to win races and do all that sort of stuff. But that's, that to me is the, is the highlight. And the last question is the hardest session you've ever done. And Tomo, you talked earlier about uh, some of the sessions that you put the girls through. Um, can you remember the hardest session from your perspective that you delivered to any of your athletes, whether it was these two or any of your other crews? Um, oh, look, it's, it's all an accumulative uh, thing as well because you, you got your fatigue as well. Um, but, you know, look, all of those 10 500s, three half-hour pieces, uh, 24K on the Ergo, um, 32K on the water up at False Creek. That was a good one. Uh, the time the time that Kate Slatter talked us to go and visit her, her grandfather's hut up in the mountain and we got white out. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of, plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, stories there. So, look... Um, I would say those 32K rows are definitely the most um, uh, mentally challenging. Uh, but when you're doing 10 500s with uh, 45 seconds off, they're probably the most physically challenging. Yep, that sounds pretty tough. Megan? Um, I think we had a few se- sessions that weren't just um, physically challenging. They were all about the mental game. And we had quite a few where we might be starting to run up the hill at Black Mountain Tower and not knowing how many times we're going to have to run up and down that hill. We'd get to the bottom and kind of look in Tomo's eyes and just go, <laughs> are we going again? <laughs> um, so we certainly Camera's had a so few good for that sort of thing. We certainly had a few sessions like that where it was all about the mental game and, you know, hitting targets. And if we didn't hit the targets, having to do more and um, not wanting to let the team down. And um, so I think that probably for me, they were probably some of more the challenging ones. But when you went bike riding and ended up sitting down and having pizza. (laughs) I think that was 2000, Tomo. (laughs) Kate, what's your hardest session? I do. I actually remember one session we were a bit knackered. So we actually, Tomo was too far away. So we just put our oars up and down on the water. So it looked like we were rowing, but we just sat still. <laughs> Didn't tell Tomo that one either until just then. Um, and for me, it'd be a toss up probably between uh, the fartlek Tomo used to do, where he'd just say go, and you'd have four women's pairs all lined up trying to shimmy their way around Cam, you know, uh, Lake Burley Griffith. 
um, and not over kill whatever rating he'd sell us, but the open rate fartleks. And he'd just sometimes be chatting to whatever bystander was with him in the boat. And I sometimes thought he forgot to say stop, but um, they were killer ones. But the, for me, the agometer, I wasn't, I don't like the echo much at all, if I'm really honest. And I remember being four minutes on, four minutes off, four times through. And I think 2K pace or something like that. And just falling off the machine with stars and just literally want to throw up. And that used to be on a Wednesday afternoon. And I used to just hate Wednesday afternoons. That really was that middle of the week hump session that I never, <laughs> never enjoyed. Yeah, that sounds pretty awful. So I'm not, I'm not surprised you're scared by that one. Well, thank you very much, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and um, a bit of a early I guess, career, um, you know, rowing career dream for me to, to bring the three of you together and to be able to interview you. And um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time um, to speak with us here. And I'm sure that there's many people watching who have absolutely loved hearing your story and, and having the opportunity to, to bring the three of you together 24 years after um, that Olympic gold medal, which is absolutely incredible. So, so thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you for what you did for women's rowing as well, because it is absolutely huge, even if that's not something that you are able to, uh, to understand from the position that you were in. So thank you and well done. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah.